Welcome. I'm Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. We're pleased to partner with Baker Botts and the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University on a conversation with Secretary James Baker, New York Times Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker, and New York staff writer Susan Glasser on Peter and Susan's book, The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we'll start with you. Uh, you had a, a, a battle with COVID-19 earlier this year, and we were all worried about you. How are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm doing great, uh, Mark. Thank you very much. I just got back from uh, my ranch in Wyoming where I was elk hunting with uh, my son and grandson. And uh, so I'm able to do that. So I feel really pretty good. And fortunately, I had what, I, what turned out to be a pretty mild case of the virus, but I want to tell everybody who's tuned in, you don't want to get it. It is no fun. It really hammers you, but I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, as, as Susan Glasser said before the call, we all want your genes, Mr. Secretary. Uh, <laughs> Susan, Peter, congratulations on the man who ran Washington. I, I, my, my first question is more of a lifestyle question. Uh, <laughs> you have out a blockbuster book, uh, we have a president with a penchant for making news, uh, and we're in the midst of the most consequential election of our lifetimes. How are you doing it? How are you balancing all these things? What What does your life look like right now? <laughs> we may be the only people who are grateful for having to stay home, Mark. <laughs> we're sitting in our living room uh, talking to you uh, now, doing all of our book appearances by Zoom. Uh, and then, you know, picking up the laptop and, you know, Peter's writing stories for the New York Times and I'm writing my column. But, you know, we're super grateful uh, to you really as the godfather in some ways of this book. And, of course, to Secretary Baker uh, for uh, enabling us over years. And it took us a long time to write this book. Well, I, I, Peter, what did you want to achieve with the man who ran Washington? Well, I think, first of all, we were surprised to learn when you would. I talked about this way back in 2013, when we sat and talked about who had not had uh, a worthy biography written of them, major figure in American life. And it was really stunning to think that nobody had written something on Secretary Baker. Not only was he Secretary of State during this incredibly consequential time, but as you pointed out, he had his, his hand in so many other events over the course of really a quarter century in, in America. And we thought his story tells us a lot about Washington in that moment as well, how things worked, how they didn't work, and how things have changed since then. So we thought that it was a great story about him, but also a larger story about uh, about Washington, about America in general. You know, Susan, I, I, um, I knew about, obviously, I've read a lot about uh, Secretary Baker's career, but in reading your book, I was reminded of so much more that he accomplished. I wonder if you could give us a cursory look at, at uh, Secretary Baker's very consequential career as a government public servant. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, I think, uh, first of all, uh, we've been calling it Secretary Baker, the world's most uh, successful mid-career switch, uh, you know, not even coming to Washington uh, until your early 40s. And yet, you know, assembling this remarkable portfolio that began with rising in barely one year's time from a relatively obscure position at the Commerce Department to running the campaign of the incumbent president of the United States, Jerry Ford, uh, you know, in and of itself, uh, a, a remarkable thing. But Mark, to your question, you know, from that period when he comes to Washington as Ronald Reagan's chief of staff in the White House, uh, you know, when you look at the record of the number of deals that were made at a time when now we can't even manage to come together as a country to pass a relief package for coronavirus uh, victims in this economic tsunami, you know, Secretary Baker was able to work with Democrats on social security reform, on tax reform in 1986. He was, uh, you know, the first thing after the very divisive 1988 campaign was to sit down with Jim Wright and to put an end to uh, the political fighting over U.S. support for the Contra Wars. Uh, and of course, he negotiated with Soviets uh, numerous uh, uh, arms control pacts, as well as the framework for the German reunification talks we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of uh, today. So, I, you know, I could go on, but it's it's a pretty remarkable record at a time when uh, any deal seems elusive in Washington today. 
I, I want to quote you, uh, Peter Susan, uh, about Secretary Baker's time as what you call the, the, the gold standard for White House chiefs of staff. And you write in the book, he had seen how Washington chewed up and uh, had chewed up and spit out would be power brokers. It was a tough city. Hubris was an occupational hazard. One day, you were the man next to the president. The next day, you were cast aside, no longer relevant, even humiliated. So, Mr. Secretary, you not only survived, you thrived. What was the key to your success? Well, I think, uh, uh, Mark, one thing, I was always uh, imbued with a, with a work ethic. My, my father and mother... Uh, always taught me never to start anything that I wasn't prepared to finish and to finish what I started. But the, re one, the reason I think that I was successful in those jobs is because I was working for some extraordinarily uh, fine, wonderful, capable presidents of the United States. And they were presidents who thought that they that the reason they were in Washington leading the country was to do the people's business and to get things done. And that's what drove me, the idea that we ought to we ought to get things done for the American people. But I think primarily my success is attributable to the wonderful presidents I worked for, but also the extraordinarily well-qualified assistants who worked with me and who came to Washington with me. Mr. Secretary, how did you, it, clearly you don't have a good relationship with the president unless you engender their trust. How did you establish the trust of the president that you worked for? Well, I think the way you do that is to perform for them. Uh, and to do what, uh, what within legal constraints and reason they want you to do and to do it uh, as expeditiously as possible, but to uh, let them know through your contact with them that they can, they can trust your word, they can rely on you, that if they assign a task to you, you're going to do everything in the world uh, to try and complete that task. Uh, I didn't have any trouble, frankly, uh, um, I, I worked for, th for three full time for three wonderful presidents, Jerry Ford, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. And of course, part time for a fourth George W. Bush. And, and I, I never had any doubt whatsoever. Uh, in four years as Ronald Reagan's chief of staff, there was only one time that I felt a little bit like I wasn't appreciated, that they didn't maybe uh, trust me. And, you know, I was the interloper. I came into the Reagan administration having run two campaigns against Ronald Reagan. And yet he asked me to be his White House chief of staff. Uh, I don't think that's ever going to happen again in, uh, in, American, in American politics. But it says something about the broad gauge nature of uh, Ronald Reagan. With George Bush, of course, I had I didn't have to establish or uh, 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 prove my trustworthiness. He, he and I had been friends for 40 years. He was my god, uh, my uh, daughter's godfather, and uh, and I had run all of his campaigns. So there was no no problem establishing trust there. Clearly, uh, Susan, you write in the book that Secretary Baker was the most consequential Secretary of State since Henry Kinder. How so? Well, you know, look, you could write a whole book, and many people have written books uh, just about this remarkable period of 1989 to 1991 uh, when the hinges of, of world history were clearly shifting. And unlike this present moment, they were largely shifting in the U.S.'s favor. But, you know, when Peter and I did this book, we had spent four years in the former Soviet Union, just a decade after these events. I think we came to a renewed appreciation for the fact that, you know, in hindsight, it may look inevitable, but it mm -hmm. wasn't really inevitable. Uh, and in particular, uh, when you look at uh, the actions that Secretary Baker took, often, you know, he himself would probably tell us today, he's a, you know, cautious man, but he took some very bold steps to make sure that, uh, the German unification, which nobody expected uh, inside his State Department before November 1989, uh, they then acted very swiftly. And by 
uh, the winter, the early winter of 1990, uh, he helped to not only come up with, but to get agreement from feuding allies over a framework for German unification, which was signed just, uh, you know, barely six months after that, uh, by the next fall. Imagine that Saddam Hussein had invaded uh, Kuwait sooner. Imagine that Gorbachev had had a coup by hardliner sooner. All of these events occurred. And so I think this is a classic example uh, of a secretary of state who mattered, uh, you know, at a moment that mattered as well, right? Uh, it's, it's the marriage of the two. Mr. Secretary, there was no certainty that the Cold War would end peacefully and lead to uh, a new era uh, in the world. What do you think made the difference uh, during that during that time in 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 uh, U.S. leadership? Well, I think I think that uh, we were consistent. Uh, you know, uh, the French and the British and the, and the Soviet Union didn't want to see Germany unified. But it was a feeling, strong feeling of George H.W. Bush, President Bush, and Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of West Germany, that, we, you know, uh, the West, writ large, had talked for many years about freeing the peoples of the captive nations of Eastern Europe. Well, some of those people were in uh, the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. And we talked about it for 40 years. Well, when the time came where we had an opportunity to try and do something about it, it would have been a crime not to try. So we tried and we were fortunately successful over the objections of the British, the French, mm. uh, and, and the Soviet Union. And as Susan just pointed out, there was a narrow window of opportunity to get this done. We were quite fortunate that we got it done, uh, and there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of people who didn't think it was going to make it <laughs> at the time. Uh, Peter, you write of Secretary Baker. He was not defined by his era. He helped to define it. Where did James Baker make his most significant mark? Well, I think continuing what we've just been saying, I think you're right to say it's not inevitable. Like it could have been so different. This was a very volatile moment. We remember it in, in hagiographic terms almost because it did work out so well, but it, it could have so easily gone the wrong way. Gorbachev could have been overthrown earlier. The hardliners could have, uh, you know, come in and, 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 and sent tanks into the east. They could have stopped. Uh, they had 300,000 troops in East Germany at the time of the negotiation that Secretary Baker is talking about here, they could have said no. And it was very uh, easy, it's very easy to imagine a scenario that would have been uh, catastrophic in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore you have to say that while the forces of history were moving and they were not you know, precipitated by Secretary Baker or President Bush necessarily, it was the fact that they figured out how to harness them and steer them in a direction that led to a positive outcome that was probably the most significant, uh, you know, achievement of this period. Mr. Secretary, as, as Peter's alluding to, you presided as Secretary of State when America had triumphed in the Cold War and stood astride in the world as the uncontested superpower. Um, how do you think America is perceived abroad today? Well, you know, the, the goal, as, as I uh, understood it and do understand it, uh, having spent four years as Secretary of State, is that you really want to be respected by your allies and feared by your adversaries. I don't think that's any longer the case today, I'm sad to say. Uh, I particularly don't think uh, that we are respected by our allies, and there are a lot of differences now between America and her allies. And I think there are some who do not appreciate how very, very important our alliances are to our international uh, well-being and to the well-being, therefore, of our of our domestic polity. I just think that. Uh, that it's too bad that we have not nurtured these alliances, which have been so important to America over the course of the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, I do think we're still perhaps feared by our adversaries as well we should be. Uh, and, and that part is probably all right, but we're, but we're not respected by our allies 
And the reason is, I think, sadly, Mark, we're not leading. I've always said that it's really important for America to lead internationally. I firmly believe that when America is engaged internationally and is leading, that we are a force for good, that we are that we are a force for peace and stability. We never all of our intervention, none of our interventions are for a gain for America in terms of territory or or treasure or anything like that. Uh, and, but there used to be a greater appreciation of America's leadership role in the world than there is today because we were doing a better job leading than we are today. Mr. Secretary, if you were at the helm uh, today, what would you do to ensure that we regain our position as a leader in the world? Well, I think we have to, the first thing I'd do is see if we can repair our alliances, strengthen them, get them, put them in the kind of good shape they were in uh, during the Cold War and during our period in office. So we relied uh, heavily on those. Uh, I don't, Germany would never have been unified without our relationship with the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, we wouldn't have won the Cold War. Uh, by ourselves, it was our it was our strong alliances, the the transatlantic alliance with Europe and our uh, security alliances with Japan and Korea and the Pacific, and those things all uh, need they, they need care and feeding and tending, and when, that's something we ought to really uh, pay attention to and start doing again uh, as we move into a new administration. What do you think the greatest trouble spot in the world is? Mr. I Secretary. think that one thing, uh, well, let me, let me say one thing that I think that's happened that is, that is good is that finally uh, we, are, we are confronting China with respect to its broken promises to the international mm -hmm. community. I'm one who worked really hard to get try and get China into the World Trading Organization. And we got them in. And we thought, and perhaps erroneously, that this would cause them to change their behavior. Uh, but it didn't. And they have, not, they have not kept their promises to the rest of the world. So I think that, that's really, do, we're doing well uh, in that regard. You ask about what the, what the biggest threats are facing America? Uh, that's not exactly what you asked, but that's part of you. That, that includes your question. Sure. Our political dysfunction is the worst challenge, biggest challenge that we face. We've got to find a way to get back to doing business the way we used to, where the, the two major political parties would cooperate and co compromise to do the people's business. We've got that problem. We've got the problem of, uh, of the fiscal, ticking fiscal debt bomb. Nobody talks about it anymore, but it is huge. And when, when interest rates go up again, and they're gonna go up again, you're gonna see terrible, terrible uh, burgeoning of that already uh, too large fiscal debt bomb. Says the, the former Secretary of the Treasury. Peter, uh, I want to go back to, to Secretary Baker's point about the dysfunction in Washington. You've covered Washington for a couple of decades now, and, and you've seen a whole lot in your experience. What is the, 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 the biggest change in Washington since uh, James Baker was in government? Yeah, I think, look, we shouldn't over-romanticize the past. It was partisan in his era, just as it's partisan today, and there were certainly moments of dysfunction then as there are now. But what's different is that, that there wasn't the that wasn't the only thing, right? That wasn't the consuming nature of Washington at that time. Secretary Baker will tell you he could be fiercely competitive in an election and then sit down after the election and work things out with Democrats. And, and the purpose of the election was to get to the point where you could govern. And I think today what you see is in some ways the opposite. The purpose of governing is to set up the next election and that there doesn't seem to be the incentive structure that there was back then, much less the people to take advantage of it, to compromise. Compromise today is a dirty word. If you compromise, it means you have given up something. You've sold out. You've, you're, you've, you've uh, uh, abandoned your party or your principles uh, 
Whereas in that era, in Baker's era, there was a value of political virtue and a political reward for showing bipartisanship, for managing to cross the aisle and say, let's solve big problems. And I think that's what we see as the most significant difference between that his Washington and today's Washington. Susan, uh, as you write in the book, one of the lessons of, of Secretary Baker's career is, as you write, when the tectonic plates of history move move with them, would somebody as, as um, competent and as adaptable as James Baker succeed in today's Washington? You know, Mark, we've been getting a, that question a lot, understandably. I do think that, uh, you know, at the moment we're living in, uh, Secretary Baker's uh, reputation for sheer competence, uh, you know, that's a word that we don't hear a lot right now. And that would uh, go far in this or any uh, moment in history. And so, you know, in part, you could you could read his story as uh, some eternal lessons uh, for how to get ahead and succeed uh, in politics. Uh, you know, don't lie to the press uh, is, is one particular lesson that Peter and I are that. appreciative yeah. of, uh, you know, but look, competence, uh, you know, always succeeds. But the broader question of to what end, uh, I do think the structural impediments to working together is, is a fundamental shift in our politics. Right now, nobody is seeking the 51% strategy. Uh, you know, people are uh, no longer seeking to persuade others. They're seeking to mobilize those who already agree with them. And I think that, you know, look, Secretary Baker, uh, you know, made a difference in many different ways, not just by, uh, you know, showing up at hard work. He's very modest to say that was the secret of his success because this town is filled with hardworking, you know, workaholic lawyers who call everybody back uh, and they don't all get to do those remarkable array of things. I think we'd like to think uh, that a Secretary Baker could come in, but in in, in all honesty, looking at this administration, uh, you know, there's no level, uh, there's no one who could manage and constrain the situation that we're in right now. That has to be the inevitable conclusion from already having, I think, more chiefs of staff uh, in the role than anyone else, already having more national security advisors in this White House than since the position was created in the mm. aftermath of World War II. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Peter and Susan write of Donald Trump in the book's introduction. He disparaged longstanding alliances that you alluded to earlier, um, vowed to rip up free trade pacts, decried American leadership outside its borders, casually embraced a new nuclear arms race, and sought to reverse the globalization that had defined international politics and economics since the end of World War II. He opposed just about everything that Baker and the modern Republican Party supported. And yet they write that while you momentarily considered writing for Joe Biden, you said to them, please don't say that I will vote for, for Biden. I will vote for the Republican. I really will. I won't leave my party. So Mr. Secretary, why are you not willing to leave a party that has so manifestly left you? Well, because uh, the main reason, uh, Mark, is that I am a conservative. Now, when I became Ronald Reagan's chief of staff and the hardline ideologues in, in the Reagan administration wouldn't give me credit for being a conservative, they beat up on me pretty good. But look, I'm a Texan, I'm a conservative, and, and I really believe in conservative principles and values. I believe in limited government. I believe in pro-growth economic policies. I believe in a strong defense. I believe in conservative judges. All of these things uh, make a big difference in my, in my calculus. Uh, I don't try to defend our current a chief executive. Uh, I've, I think they write it, they quote me and they're saying he's his own worst enemy. And, they, and maybe quote me as saying something uh, more negative than that. Uh, but but at, at the end of the day, and let me say one thing before, I, at the end of the day, I'm a conservative and I am concerned about the direction of our country. I have 19 grandchildren and five great grandchildren and I want to see the kind of America that I was uh, privileged to enjoy, see that enjoyed by my grandchildren and great grandchildren. And I look at that Democratic platform, which Joe Biden is going to have to support 
and it scares the hell out of me. And I want to say, though, having said that, I like Joe Biden. I've worked with him. He's been down here to the Baker Institute, I think, at least twice. I respect him as a man who uh, is, likes, as I did, to reach across the aisle and probably try to get some things done. But I worry when I look at that platform uh, about how uh, really radical and liberal it is. So that's why I am going to stay where I am. It's not a party thing. It's really not an individual thing. It's it has to do with the future direction of our country. Mr. Secretary, you, you mentioned you, you worked with Joe Biden while you were in government. Uh, Joe Biden was the yeah. senator from Delaware. Uh, right. I, I remember, uh, you mentioned well, the dysfunction. He was vice president, too. And I went up president there and, and, yeah. and worked with him, with him and with President Obama and others on the New START Treaty uh, and helped, helped with that a little bit. Uh, so that's what I meant by that. No, I understand. And, and I, I, you know Joe Biden. Again, you worked with him in, in, in his capacity as senator and vice president. Uh, you mentioned the dysfunction in Washington. We've alluded to the divisions in our country. Would Joe Biden be good in uniting the country and bringing Washington together as a consensus builder? It would depend entirely upon the extent and degree to which he is bound to that platform and the deal that he had to cut with the more progressive elements in his party, I think. I mean, uh, Joe would, uh, is essentially one who would like to sit down and, and reach across the aisle and find a, an agreement, find a deal. Just like, I mean, I, just like I used to do all the time. That's the way you govern. That's the way you ought to govern. Uh, politics is the art of compromise. As Peter said, compromise today is a dirty word. My worry about uh, Joe, frankly, is that he has to pay a lot of attention now to those elements that control the Democratic Party, which has moved very, very far left, and that scares me. You, you, one of the differences in, in uh, ensuring that there was a, uh, a peaceful resolution to the Cold War, Mr. Secretary, and you talked about it, is the humility and restraint by the 41st president, George Bush. And, and frankly, it, it mirrored your own humility and restraint. Uh, I wonder, did the president's performance in the debate last week give you pause about, about Donald Trump and his ability to be the commander in chief of our nation? Well, I've already told you I had, res I had reservations about our current uh, chief executive. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not going to vote for him because of the larger issue that we just went through. But I thought that debate was a disaster. But I didn't think that he, I didn't think either candidate was particularly effective. But what I really regretted was the nature of the food fight. That, that's not the way presidential debates ought to ought to go. And I and I frankly felt really sorry for Chris Wallace, whom I've known forever and who's a wonderful journalist. But it was terrifically difficult to control to control the dialogue in that debate. And I, I thought the debate when in fact was a food fight. Having had COVID-19, uh, Secretary, and experiencing the, the, the virus firsthand, it, it, how would you would you have managed the COVID-19 crisis differently than the Trump administration has? Well, I don't know. Um, perhaps so. One thing that I think is, uh, is important to remember is how, how vital message discipline is when you're running the White House or when you're running a campaign. You ought to make sure that everybody has the, has the story and that everybody sticks to it and that it's uniform. And you don't change your, your story every, every so often. And I'm afraid that's what was going on in the briefings on the, on the virus for, in, the, in the press room at the White House. Right. Uh, Susan, what is, the, what is the legacy of James A. Baker III? How do you think he will go down in history? Well, uh, you know, 
Secretary Baker is is good at speaking for himself, as we've heard. Uh, you know what Peter and I were struck by in our conversations with him uh, was always a, a you know a real palpable desire uh, to escape the label of you know really having been a political. Uh, handler, uh, a political strategist, and to be remembered as a statesman and uh, a diplomat, uh, in addition to being a Texan, I'm sh quite sure that that will be uh, uh, a big part of his legacy and his family's legacy. But, you know, what I would say is that I might disagree a tiny bit and say that he was a master political strategist, but in a big definition of politics, whether that was politics in the American sense running five national presidential campaigns, or politics in the international sense, and that he really brought, in fact, a, a canny politician's uh, sense to the necessities of creating a post-Cold War uh, order that would uh, endure, and that it was uh, politics in the biggest possible sense, defining the age from the end of Watergate to the end of the Cold War. Peter, what are your thoughts on President, uh, or, or, or whether on uh, Secretary Baker's uh, legacy. <laughs> that was, that might have been a Freudian clip. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, he would have been an interesting president. I think that would have been uh, uh, a different counterfactual in history, right? Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything Susan said. I think he wants, obviously, and he can speak for himself, but I think that uh, he would point to his time as Secretary of State as a statesman. The first of the two memoirs he wrote, of course, was about his four years as Secretary of State. He didn't want at first, anyway, to focus on the rest of his story. Later, I think, and I'm glad he did, uh, wrote a political memoir about his time, uh, you know, in other jobs. But, you know, I think that it's, it's uh, you know, you you quote the book saying he was the most consequential Secretary of State since Kissinger. I could even make the argument more so, honestly. I, with all respect to Secretary Kissinger, I know Se Secretary Kissinger has a certain celebrity that's uh, that precedes everybody. But I, I think that that four-year period in our lifetime, uh, you know, in the in the post -Cold, in the post World War II era, you know, stands out as 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 Susan said, the hinge of history changing. So I think that's that's it's hard to beat that legacy. Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, clearly you will be remembered as a as a great statesman. But as Peter and Susan point out, you ran five presidential campaigns, which is uh, absolutely stunning. Uh, as we approach. <laughs> Uh, the presidential election of, of 2020 and, and election day, do you worry about the soundness of our system? You know, I really don't, Mark. I, I think our institutions are strong. I know there's a, there are people out there who are really worried about whether we're going to um, eliminate some of our important institutions or diminish them. Or, um, but, but I have perhaps have, having spent so much time uh, uh, with presidents close up, I, I have a I have a sense of the restraints that they are subject to, uh, and I I just do not I really don't worry about American democracy. I worry about. Uh, some discreet things from time to time. I, I, you know, I, I'll have to tell you. You probably think this. I'm saying this just because I'm a Republican. It's not true. I worry about court packing. I packing the Supreme Court. I worry about uh, attacks on our Constitution that are done in a legal way. But I do not worry about the system surviving. We, you, you read a lot some nowadays about our democracy is under attack or under assault. There are so many restraints upon a president's ability uh, to, to get off the rails, if you will, that I really don't worry about that. The, the, our, our system of checks and balances is quite effective and quite strong in my view. I won't ask you who you will vote for, Mr. Secretary, because you've made that pretty clear. But I will ask you, how will you cast your vote? Where? Well, how, how will you do it by mail? Will you go to the polls? How will you physically cast your vote? No, I'll go, I'll go to the polls and vote absentee. How, During the Mr. Secretary, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, when, when the history is written about your, uh, your service uh, in government, how do you wish to be remembered? You know, I went to a, a, an event after I left uh, 
as uh, after I left government, after Jerry Ford lost to Jimmy Carter in a campaign that I ran for Jimmy for Jerry Ford or led for Jerry Ford, I went to an event in Lake Como, and there were a number of people there. There were political people and substantive people, and uh, one of the guys that was there was a guy named Bob Shrum. I, I, you all may remember Bob. He was a Kennedy political operative, and he was he was quite accomplished politically and. And uh, I remember the moderator asked or asked a question of of Trump that uh, that had to do with with substance, some substantive issue. And Trump said, "Look, you ought to ask Baker that question." He said, "He does politics and policy. I just do politics." Well, I'm really <laughs> proud, frankly, of the fact that I was able to achieve something in politics and in policy. And that's why I entitled my uh, first memoir about my time as Secretary of State, The Politics of Diplomacy. Because I think my political experience really helped me uh, in, in, in those jobs, in both White House Chief of Staff, which is a big political job, yes, but then as Treasury Secretary and as Secretary of State. But you asked me how I want to be remembered. Is that what you asked me? I guarantee yes, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how I want to be remembered. I want to be remembered as the guy who ran five presidential campaigns for three different Republican presidents and then served as chief of staff for two different Republican presidents, and then served for almost four years as Secretary of the Treasury and four years as Secretary of State, and, and spent 12 years in Washington and left unindicted. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> that's how I want to be remembered. I think that's my biggest accomplishment is that I didn't get well, inside. Well, I have no doubt that you will be remembered for all that and more. And Mr. Secretary, I can't let you go without asking you uh, what advice would you give young aspiring Jim Bakers who wish to make uh, a career in government service? I, I know you've talked about the the five P's and the importance of hard work, uh, your, your five P rule, which is prior preparation prevents poor performance. Uh, right. but, but you've been alluded to a humility. You're, you're not telling us something, some key ingredient to your great success. What would you tell young folks today? Well, I, I think that, uh, if you want, if you want to have a role in policy, you need to understand that, Politics is the way you get to practice policy. I've always seen the two, and Peter and Susan make this quite clear in a, a, a two discrete uh, uh, pursuits. Politics is one thing. Politics is, is getting uh, elected so that you can do policy. And, uh, and therefore, I would tell young people that you ought to figure out some way at some point in your career to do some politics. You don't have to get out and run for the legislature every time the bell rings like the Dalmatian jumping on the fire truck and so forth. You can, you can wait. You can do something else significant. Uh, with your life before this is a theory that George H.W. Bush had and pretty much that I share. Do something consequential with your life. And then if you want to go into politics, go into politics. But remember that it takes a lot of grunge work. Politics is crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And a lot of it is just grunge work. But that's what gives you the opportunity to practice policy. And, uh, and I think it also rewards, gives you, gives you a sense of, uh, of reward or accomplishment that you've been able to put something back into the system. You put something back into the system, not just by practicing policy or exer you know, um, exercising policy, but by participating in politics. We are the best country in the world, notwithstanding what you read a lot about how terrible America is and so forth. I tell people, I flew all, all over the world for four years and I, and I had the, the opportunity to see 
uh, how other countries and other people hold us in such high regard. People know that everybody wants to come to America. Nobody wants to leave America. So I, I don't like to hear all of the negativism that we hear and, and, uh, and the condemning of America that goes on. We've got the finest country in the world, and it's a country that every citizen ought to find a way to somehow give something back to. It's a wonderful note on which to end. Uh, Peter Baker, Susan Glasser, congratulations on the man who ran Washington, a, a remarkable uh, account of, uh, of Secretary Baker's consequential life. And Secretary Baker, thank you for your uh, remarkable service to our nation. Thank you, Mark, very much. On behalf of our co-hosts, the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University and Baker Botts, thank you for joining us. Signed copies of The Man Who Ran Washington are available for sale at lbjstore.com, now offering curbside pickup for those local to Austin. These programs are made possible by contributions from our members. You can support us by joining Friends of the LBJ Library at lbjfriends.org. See you next time.